Today in our Things to Come series, week six of this four-week series that we had begun, um, yeah, it's kind of what it's becoming. It wasn't intended to really go this on, but we're, we're going to be wrapping it up soon, um, maybe by next Sunday, we'll see. Um, and then we're going to be getting into the book of Colossians, verse by verse, really excited about that. Uh, but this has been a great series. And uh, we today are going to be, as we're following this kind of outline that we've been looking at, our timeline, uh, looking at events to come on that prophetic calendar, the rapture being the next thing to come that has nothing that needs to happen before the rapture. There's nothing else to be fulfilled. The rapture is the next thing on the prophetic horizon, and it's that imminent return of Jesus where we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, where we'll be with him in heaven for seven years, uh, celebrating this marriage feast and then and then the tribulation unfolds during that time seven year tribulation on the earth which is God's judgment upon the world for rejecting Christ but it's also time where he's stirring in and restoring the nation of Israel because uh, this is in fulfillment to Daniel chapter 9 and the and the 70 week prophecy given to Israel so that's a tribulation period and then at the end of the tribulation Christ comes back again he comes back to this earth, literally, physically, sets his foot down on the world. He brings an end to all the, you know, different campaign, that battle of Armageddon that we talked about last week. He brings an end to it, regathers Israel, and then moves us into the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, for some of you, when you hear millennium, this is what pops into your mind, right, Aaron? Exactly. And this is what exactly you think of the Millennium Falcon. And this is what's kind of, anytime you've heard millennium, this is what you think about. Well, we're going to be looking at what the millennium is all about here today. Now, the, the name millennium comes from a Latin term meaning a thousand years. And it's really only mentioned here in Revelation 20. A lot of people kind of dismissed the legitimacy of a millennium or the literalness of it because like, oh this isn't talked about in scripture but yet in revelation chapter 20 if you don't have that open yet turn there to revelation 20 because that's where we're going to be kind of camped out in primarily today and so in those first seven verses the thousand years is mentioned six times Six times in seven verses. So this is something that is repeated to kind of get you to realize, oh, this, this is probably important. This isn't something that just kind of flash over and say, ah, you know, it's like a thousand years. No, it's like a thousand years is repeated uh, six times in seven verses for us here to really um, bring some clarity to this. And yet, it's the only time that it's mentioned in that way is here in Revelation 20. Yet, we see this talked about all through scripture and we're going to see that as we go through this a little bit but what we're going to look at here today is we're going to see the process of the millennium how this all kind of comes about we're going to see the place of the millennium we're going to see the people of the millennium and then the program of the millennium so these are the things that we're going to look at and talk about here today so when we deal with the process of the millennium how this all comes about there's three major views regarding this event and how it's going to all unfold or even maybe not unfold as to some of the views that are held here so first of all we have a post-millennial view a post-millennial view of the rapture meaning or the trip millennium meaning that christ is going to come back after post the millennium christ comes after the millennium so this view holds that this period is is going to be a time ushered in by the church the church will advance the gospel in the world and the world will just become more and more, you know, gospel-centered, saved, Christ-like, and it's just going to make it all the more kingdom-ready until we're just basically living in the kingdom. And all the Lord has to do is just kind of show up and go, hey, thanks, you got it all set up for me, that's wonderful. Nothing left to do, I guess, but just to sit down on the throne that's kind of the idea of post-millennialism and that view that is held now that view was very popular kind of early on thinking that the church is going to be the ones instituting and and um establishing inaugurating the the millennium the kingdom of god also known as kingdom now theology or dominionism so when you hear those terms that are still applied to people still hold to those views, they believe that we're just going to make the world better, that as the church 
Uh, Christians, we need to just kind of influence all the different spheres of culture and just slowly kind of Christianize the world until it's just kingdom ready. And the Lord's just gonna show up and just kind of, you know, take over in a sense, right? That's the view that some hold. That's the post-millennial view. And that view, uh, you know, had a lot of momentum, but then began to lose momentum as, you know, we saw the increase in wars, as we saw trouble um, just continue to unfold, the advancement of weapons and violence in the world to where the church is kind of sitting back going, either we're not doing a very good job of this or we've got the wrong idea as to how the millennium is gonna unfold. And that's, in my opinion, I- exactly right. Because the Bible, nowhere will you see in the Bible that the world is gonna get better and better and more and more, um, you know, Christ-like in a sense. In fact, the, word, the Bible tells us that, that the love of many is gonna grow cold. People are gonna, are gonna fall away from the faith and, and there's just gonna be an increase. Jesus says before he comes, there's gonna be an increase in all these you know, deceptions, wars, things like that. The Bible doesn't ever say that's gonna get better. Now, it's still, we as a church want to be active in the world. We want to be going forth saying, man, I want this to be the best place it can be. I want to have an influence in the world. I want to shine for Jesus. No doubt that should be our MO as we are living about in this world. But we understand we're not expecting things to become that way. Don't get disheartened. Don't get disillusioned. The Bible says it's going to be that way, but we continue to shine for Jesus, and we know that it's only going to get better when Jesus comes back again you with me church all right so then the next view that we see here after post-millennialism is amillennialism amillennial is you take that letter a which kind of cancels out millennium it means no millennium and this view believes that the reign of christ is happening presently right now on earth it's a symbolic act as the whole of the book of revelation is simply spiritualized They believe that the kingdom was basically inaugurated when Christ died on the cross. Satan was defeated at the cross and now we're living in this kind of spiritualized millennium. Christ is reigning. Christ is on the throne. Everything's great. We're just sort of living this millennium though it's not gonna be a literal physical reign of Christ on the earth. That's all millennial view. They believe Satan is presently chained up but just has a very long chain. We'll talk about that later here. But here's J. Vernon McGee. Here's what J. Vernon McGee says about all millennialism. He says this. Most all millennialists fit the millennium into the present age and all the events recorded in Revelation are somehow fitted into the facts of history like pieces are fitted into a crazy quilt. Frankly, I think that the results of this viewpoint are about the same. You come up with a crazy quilt. So that's J. Vernon McGee's uh, take on all millennialism and there are many that adhere to this view today in, in the church that we're just kind of living a spiritualized reign of christ everything's great and we just eventually kind of move into eternity and that's the view that many hold adherence to this view however um you know what they need to do is they need to fit all the promises from the old testament that were given to israel they now apply that to the church they say the church has just kind of become the new israel and in other words then the promises that god gave to israel that were unconditional and were given to the nation of israel well, if you see that just now transfer to the church, then you go, well, God didn't really uphold those promises then to Israel. And, and if God changed that, God had a change of mind or whatever, then, then who's to say that he's gonna, you know, neg- neg- um, negate the promises that we see elsewhere in God's word? So it really diminishes then kind of your, your view of God potentially. God's unchanging, And what God says, God is gonna do. And if God says he's gonna have these promises for Israel, he's gonna fulfill those promises to Israel. And those promises are gonna be fulfilled mostly in the millennium. It's a very important time here. So that's the all-millennial view. Lastly, we see a pre-millennial view. This is the view that I hold. I'm I'm sharing all these different views so that you kind of see what some people might be thinking and how they view the millennium. But uh, this series, Things to Come, is to kind of share... Uh, some of the things that we believe as a church 
here at Riverside. This is the view that I hold to, premillennial view, which holds to the literal interpretation of Revelation, which makes it clear that the Lord is going to come back to the earth at the close of that seven-year tribulation period, and he's the one that's going to usher in the kingdom, the millennium, that thousand-year literal physical reign of Christ on the earth. He's the one that's going to do it. We can't set that up. He's got to be the one that does it, and he's going to do it at the end of the tribulation. Now, for you students of the Bible, you know that in, 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 and this is just brought up food for thought in case some people have kind of wondered about this a little bit. You know that in Daniel 12, verse 11 and 12, there's a reference to 1290 days from the midpoint of the tribulation. And then it says there's a blessing for those who come to the 1335 days. Yet, as we saw last week, in Revelation 12, verse six, it speaks of there being 1260 days from the midpoint of the tribulation. 1260 days is three and a half years, right? On the, that Babylonian calendar that was used. And so why is there then an extra 75 days given in Daniel? Well, it seems in, it's 1260 days, three and a half years from the abomination of desolation to the end of the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus. But then these 75 days brings into account the regathering of Israel, millennial temple, preparations, the sheep and the goat judgment. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So there's an extra bit of time frame as Jesus comes back. Again, things have been just decimated with the different, you know, uh, work of the Antichrist and the, this campaign of Armageddon. Jesus comes, brings an end to it. And so there's a period of time where things are, are getting established, restored. There's some judgment and there's a moving into the kingdom. So there's a period of time that Daniel brings into play that you don't see in Revelation. It's not contradicting anything. It's just an addition to see what's going to be taking place at a second coming and then moving into the millennium. Now, like I said, there is much to be written on this time period this millennial reign the millennium is kind of like that that you know cap on human history in fact it's interesting because many believe that you know we've kind of completed now six thousand years of human history right from the time of the the, the dating of adam's creation up until now about six thousand years isn't it interesting that that last period of time another thousand years would complete 7,000 years, that kind of age of uh, a week, that time of creation where God works for six days and on the seventh day, he rests. Moving into that last thousand year period of time, that time of rest where everything is perfect and completed and done. So it's believed that we could be very close to moving in as we've completed 6,000 years of human history, moving into that millennial period of time. Exciting? Just an idea, throwing it out there. We don't know for sure, but uh, I'm, I'm ready for it. I don't know about you. So here's what we see now. As I said, that the millennium is that period of time that many of the prophets, uh, you know, both major prophets, minor prophets wrote about. Every prophet spoke about this period of time. The millennium. In fact, they spoke about this period of time more than anything else. They didn't have really that concept of heaven that we have. We always think of eternity as being heaven, right? You know, we, we die, we go to be with the Lord, we're in heaven, and that's it. It's like, that's eternity now, right? And we get this view like we're just gonna be sitting around on a cloud and just kind of floating around. Sometimes we think, man, that seems like it might be kind of boring. What are we gonna do all this time? But understand that eternity is gonna be much more than just going to heaven. We're gonna be with Jesus in heaven when we die or at the rapture, but then we're coming back again. We're gonna be on this earth and it's gonna be this period of time where it's just perfection again as the earth is restored and so the prophets didn't have that concept of heaven as we think of it today but they had this view of the millennial reign of christ this period of time when everything is going to be restored again and the kingdom of god is going to be enacted and inaugurated here on earth in fact here's just a few scriptures that speak about the millennial uh reign of christ and again this is not an exhaustive list but if you look at these scriptures uh, you will see that this is the reference in these scriptures is this time period of this millennial reign of Christ, this thousand year reign of Christ. And again, uh, we're not gonna be doing an exhaustive list by, uh, or an exhaustive study by any means. This is a pretty grand subject and we're just gonna be kind of flying over this and just getting an aerial view kind of of the millennium here today. So again, we're looking at 
the process of the millennium. We've seen that, that it's gonna come after the second coming of Christ. He inaugurates it, he establishes. But now let's look at the place of the millennium. We've kind of already talked about this and answered that, but this is all gonna be going down, my friends, here on planet Earth. That's what's exciting, right? Is, is again, eternity is not just kind of floating in space somewhere in heaven. What is that gonna look like? Eternity is gonna be a big part of being here on Earth again. A thousand years on earth and the earth understand has been under this curse since genesis 3 when adam and eve sinned the world has been cursed but during the millennium the earth is going to be restored it's going to be lifted from that curse and we're going to see creation the whole planet of earth the way that god has intended it to be which is glorious Fabulous, wonderful. Right now, we only see things very dimly. I mean, we look at the world right now and we go, man, it is pretty beautiful. We live in a beautiful place, don't we? And we can look at creation and go, man, that is amazing. And yet, we're seeing things as they are under the curse. Think about what it's gonna be like when the curse is lifted and the earth is restored, but the millennium is gonna be going down and it's gonna affect all of the earth. Romans 8 verse 19 to 22 says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So understand that even all the creation, they're awaiting the arrival of the Lord. All the creation is going, man, we're under the curse. We're in bondage right now. We can't wait for this to be lifted. The Bible says in, I believe it's in Isaiah, that when the Lord comes back, that the trees of the hills will be clapping their hands, right? I don't know if that's literal. I tend to think it is because who, I mean, God can do that. Wouldn't that be amazing? Just the fields or the trees are just like clapping their hands going, all right, the king has arrived. This is what we've been waiting for. I know it's probably figurative, but just let me dream, okay? I, I think I, God can do that. We don't know. But it's gonna be exciting. The trees of the, of the hills are gonna be clapping their hands rejoicing all the creation is going to be rejoicing this world is going to be renewed it's going to be restored it's going to become a perfect place again as god has intended it to be the earth is going to go through this transformation at the return of the lord in fact it tells us that uh there's going to be a spring of living water that's going to be opened up in jerusalem and flowing down into the dead sea a spring of living water like you know most uh, cities in, in, in history, um, you know, in the past, were built around rivers. A, a body of water was super important. But Jerusalem doesn't have a, a, a river near. It's not, there's no water, source of water right there around Jerusalem, but it's going to be opened up when Christ comes back again. We know that he's going to set his feet down the Mount of Olives, and the mountain's going to be split. Well, notice what Zechariah says here. Chapter 14, verse eight. And in that day, it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the Eastern Sea and half of them toward the Western Sea. In both summer and winter, it shall occur. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. Amen. Living water is gonna flow down. And it's gonna flow into the Eastern Sea. What is that? That's the Dead Sea. Notice what Ezekiel 47 verse 8 says. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed and it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to En Englem. They will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea, exceedingly many. So we're seeing a reference to the Dead Sea and this is remarkable because the Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. It's dry, it's desolate. Uh, anybody been to the Dead Sea before? All right, that's awesome. And, and I've sat at En Gedi, right? And it's dry, but it's beautiful. And yet they're saying here now, the scriptures tell us that this water's gonna be opened up. The Dead Sea is gonna be brought back to life. There's nothing living in the Dead Sea today. You go in there and it's so filled with salt, you just 
float and it's amazing to experience that it really is and there's nothing living in there and yet in this day when things are restored and renewed living water is going to flow in and it's going to teem with fish just like in the mediterranean sea they're going to be fishing there in the dead sea in the millennium how many people love fishing all right come on you, you can fish in the millennium eternity is not floating on a cloud you can go fishing or surfing or skiing i mean i don't know i'm reading into that a little bit more than i need to but i hope there'll be those things it's going to be amazing though guys this millennial reign of christ when things are transformed i'll be going to these people fishing saying son i remember when i used to float in this sea there was nothing living here now look at it you're fishing if only you knew it's amazing so the millennium is taking place on a renewed earth and again it's not just jerusalem this is going to encompass the whole of the earth everything is going to be made new and perfect greta thunberg is finally going to be happy <laughs> let's pray she's here let's pray she gets to witness this but you see we like to think oh we and and listen i'm i'm not a against you know we need to be good stewards of the environment no doubt but we get this concept in in our humanistic thinking that we're the ones that need to save the planet we're the ones that need to save ourselves if we just try harder if we just do more we're going to make ourselves better we're going to be acceptable to god we're going to change the planet we're going to fix everything listen only the lord can fix these things and he is going to fix it the time is coming when he's going to make all things new and it's going to be restored i'm not saying stop recycling but i'm just saying our hope is not in humanity our hope is in the lord amen. all right amen okay <laughs> will do so we've seen the process of the millennium the place of the millennium let's look at the people of the millennium here now we can look at revelation 20 if you're not already there jump into revelation chapter 20 with your bibles here open and let's see what scripture say we're going to start in verse 4 we'll cover we'll cover all um oh let's see we'll cover all 10 verses of this chapter but right now we're going to start in verse 4 and read to verse 6 and it says this and i saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them then i saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to jesus and for the word of god who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with christ for a thousand years but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him a thousand years wow so to begin with we the church again we were we've been in heaven for seven years during the tribulation when christ comes back again we are accompanying him at his side revelation 19 talked about the armies of heaven coming with him the bride of christ dressed in fine linen we the bride of christ are with jesus coming back with him at a second coming and so we move into the millennium with them thrones john sees in verse 4 thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them that's speaking of us the church i believe and coming back again there's going to be old testament saints who at the time now are given their resurrected bodies and tribulation saints those that have come through the tribulation or not come through sorry those that were in the tribulation who put their faith in jesus who were martyred and killed they're going to too be given their resurrected glorified bodies now we've been given ours at the rapture first thessalonians 4 talks about that we are in our resurrected glorified bodies as we come back with the lord old testament saints are with the lord in heaven but at this point now at a second coming before the millennium comes into play they're given their resurrected bodies as well as the the tribulation saints that is the first resurrection as it's referred to here in in um revelation 20 the first resurrection is not an event as a one-time thing it's an order of events it begins with jesus the first fruits of our resurrection it starts with jesus then it's the church it's raptured up and and all those that um the new testament saints that have passed away that's why paul wrote first thessalonians people were concerned what's gonna happen to them they died and and jesus didn't come back yet paul says no they're gonna be raised up they're, they're gonna be raised up before we even are caught up to meet the lord in the air at the rapture so they're given the resurrected bodies then 
It's the Old Testament saints at the time of the second coming and tribulation saints. That's the order and the first resurrection that's complete here now. Now, those that died apart from faith in Jesus are in a place known as in the Old Testament, Sheol or Hades. It's not hell. It's not, it's not the final resting place or place of punishment like a fire. We learned last week that it was the beast and the Antichrist, the Antichrist, sorry, the beast and the false prophet who are put in the lake of fire at the coming of Christ. And they're the first inhabitants of hell. Satan's not even there yet. Satan doesn't have access to hell. Satan is that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour right now active in the world. So at the end of the millennium, we're going to get into this next week, give you a preview right now. At the end of the millennium, we're going to see what's known as the great white throne judgment. That's for all the dead that have died without faith in Jesus. And it's their final sentence. And then they are sentenced to hell or the lake of fire, sad as that is. So the first resurrection is for all believers. In other words now, it's believers, as we talk about the people of the millennium, believers that are entering into the millennium. The church, Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, but there's another group of people that are brought into the in millennium because right now, all those that we've mentioned have been given their resurrected, glorified, eternal bodies. But now Jesus talks about something in Matthew 25. When he comes back again, he says that he's gonna judge the nations. There's the judgment of the nations or what's known as the judgment of the sheep and goats. We alluded to that earlier. Matthew 25 uh, tells us that when he comes back again, he's gonna separate people, those that have faith in Christ and those that don't. He says the sheep on his right, my right is over here, the goats on his left. The sheep are believers, the goats are unbelievers. And here's what he says to those on his right, to the sheep, Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom now prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Again, those on his left, the goats, the unbelievers, are gonna be sent to Hades, where they're gonna await now their final sentencing after the millennium at the great white throne judgment. And then it tells us that Hades and, and all the, you know, gave up their dead, they're placed in a lake of fire. So that's kind of the process. I hope I'm not confusing you right now, but just giving you a bit of clarity as to what's happening. So it's believers now that enter into the millennium. But here's what's really amazing with this is we're gonna have people like the church in their resurrected glorified bodies. And there's gonna be others that are brought in that have made it through the tribulation with faith in Jesus who are now in their earthly, natural mortal bodies and these two groups of people are going to be existing together in the millennium i find that so wild is that amazing i'm going to be there with my seven foot frame and i'm going to be challenging all these earthly natural people to a good game of volleyball it's going to be great you know let's, let's play a game chumps let's see how you do you know no i won't be doing that but maybe we'll see but it's amazing that we're gonna have these people. And so what's gonna happen is people in their natural bodies are gonna be brought to the millennium and there's gonna be life being conducted as normal in a sense. And there's people that are gonna be, reproduction is gonna be happening. People are gonna be born during this time. And with the conditions of the world perfect, the curse has been lifted. People are gonna be living longer lives. Perfect conditions. Just like we saw in Genesis, right? Before uh, the flood of Noah, where the, you look at some of the genealogies and people were living hundreds and hundreds of years. The same thing is gonna be taking place in the millennium. There's gonna be, I believe, a great population explosion as people live longer, as gives more and more time for people to be born. The earth is gonna be replenished and repopulated and it's gonna be a, a huge amount of people under these perfect conditions. It tells us in Isaiah 65 verse 20 regarding this time period, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die 100 years old. Now that verse is not to emphasize the death of a child, that verse is to emphasize that if a person dies in the millennium at 100 years old, it's gonna be like they're dying in their youth. They're gonna be dying like as a child age at 100 years old. That's what it's emphasizing here. People are gonna live longer. So it's pretty remarkable to think of these two different types of people living during this time, but we'll all be living for 
and worshiping Jesus. Remember, it's only believers that come into the millennium. And we're gonna talk more about some of our activity next as we look at now the program of the millennium. First of all, this time is going to be a righteous reign of Jesus. That's what we're gonna experience all the more during the millennium is the righteous reign and rule of Jesus. Just as he's desired all along to rule in our lives and yet people have walked in disobedience and rebellion to God. They've missed out on experiencing the blessing that God has for them. Now we're gonna see that lived out in full as we live under the righteous rule of Jesus in the millennium. Sin, sin is not going to be present in the sense that it's gonna be acted upon. People that are in their natural bodies will of course have a sin nature but it's not gonna be acted upon. Why? Because the enemy is not gonna be present. Look at what we read in Revelation 20, verse one. All right, look at that with me. Revelation 20, verse one. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should de deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So here we see that Satan, the devil, a dragon is bound and he's put into this bottomless pit. This is a place that's like this incarceration a prison for demons for the devil right now at this point where they are unable now to do anything they're in prison basically you remember that when jesus with his disciples were coming to the uh country of the gatherings and that was in luke chapter 8 comes to the uh, country of the gatherings and there there's this demon possessed man possessed with many demons legion was named there there's many and, and Jesus, this man was, was a wild man. They would oftentimes, interestingly, it says that they would bind him up, but he would break the chains. And when Jesus came, they knew, oh boy, we're in trouble now, Jesus is here. And what did they say? They said, we ask that you do not command us to go into the abyss. What's the abyss? The bottomless pit. That's what this is translated, the abuso, the bottomless pit, abyss. And they this man was possessed by demons spoke to Jesus and said, please do not command us to go into the abyss because they knew that's where they would be trapped, unable to do anything. They asked that they could be thrown into that, you know, herd of, of pigs and Jesus allowed that. And notice, so Satan now is placed in this bottomless pit where he's inactive. He's chained, he's sealed, he's, he's unable to do anything now. We no longer have the presence of the enemy, so we no longer have that sin nature being stirred up, so sin is not being acted upon during the millennium. And notice, I, I love this here in Revelation 20 because we oftentimes think of Satan as kind of the counterpart to God or to Jesus. We think they're kind of like on, on equal ground, only Satan's like the, the evil, you know, and God's the good, right? Satan is by no means equal to Jesus. Jesus is fully God. And Satan is not at all equal with Jesus. In fact, God doesn't even have to come down and take care of Satan himself. What does he do? Just sends an angel. Angel, go deal with this guy. Why? Because God is fully in control. God is the one that has full rule over every principality and power. And there's nothing that they can do that God doesn't allow them to do. Now you think, why would God ever allow Satan then to have kind of you know, dominion in this world, to have his way? He's called the, the prince uh, of the air, the ruler of this world. Why would God ever give Satan that ability? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a moment here. But while Satan is imprisoned, we're gonna experience this perfect reign of righteousness. And we're gonna be, as it says in verse four, we're gonna be reigning and ruling with Jesus. We're gonna be placed on thrones, judgments being given to us so that we're gonna be those that are, are seeing that, you know, again, people are living out this law of God, this reign and, and righteousness of God. But understand something, it's during the millennium that the, the new covenant is enacted 
and a play. And that's the covenant that's going to be written on our hearts. This is not something that we are having to follow from an outward legal manner. This is something that's going to be just created inside us, written in our heart, where it's going to be no problem to follow the Lord. And we're going to be seeing that we all together as those that are reigning with Christ are seeing this righteousness lived out, this obedience to the Lord, this following of the Lord lived out, which is going to be at this time a very natural thing for us, I believe. But notice here, during the millennium, because Satan's bound, no temptation, there's going to be no crime, there's going to be no trouble, no wars. It's amazing. Isaiah 2, 4 says, He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Doesn't that sound pretty good to you? We're not going to have any threat of one another. We're going to be able to leave our houses with a door unlocked. In fact, probably won't even need doors. We're going to be like, ah, pff, whatever. No problem, there's no threat, there's no trouble that's gonna be facing us. And there's gonna be just, again, a restoration of all things. The threat of anything is gonna be eliminated. Isaiah 11, verse six says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And we always have in our mind, whenever somebody repeats, it's the lion lays down with the lamb. That's not biblical, actually, even though we know the concept is true, but the Bible says it's the wolf that will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Isn't that amazing? The young child shall lead them. It's like you'll be out walking around or driving, and, and you'll see a child just walking down with like a lion, like on a leash, and just say, hey, Come on, kitty cat, right? It's like amazing. There's no threat because that, that kind of killer instinct in, in the animal kingdom is going to be taken away again, just like it was at the beginning with Adam in the garden having dominion over the animals. There's, there's going to be no threat. It goes on to say in verse 8, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. The nursing child shall play by the cobra. So I wonder how long it's going to take moms to kind of remember that, oh, there's no threat, right? Because I'm sure moms will be like, no, don't go over there, little Susan. Don't play by the... Oh, no, wait, there's no... Actually, yeah, have at it. Go pick up that viper. See if I care, right? <laughs> have at it. I wonder how it's going to probably take, probably take 100, 100 years or so for moms to kind of settle into that place of like, oh, yeah, right, I can breathe. I don't have to be a helicopter parent right now. I can just... Hang loose and they're going to be fine. It's going to be great. Just check in with me, Susan, in like another month or so. Let me know how it's going, right? It'll be like that kind of, it's going to be amazing. It's great. Okay, so the millennium, going to be glorious. But what, what is truly going to make this time a very glorious time is that Jesus is going to be present physically, bodily, literally, Jesus is going to be there. And, and we're going to see him sitting and reigning on David's throne, fulfilling those Old Testament promises that were given to Israel. A temple is going to be rebuilt. Priestly services are going to be renewed. Sacrifices are going to be taking place, but we're not offering sacrifices to atone for sin. We're offering sacrifices as a memorial of God's goodness and faithfulness to us. The feasts are going to be observed. People will be worshiping the Lord and walking in full obedience under the new covenant that's now written on our hearts and we're going to be experiencing the life and the beauty of life as it was meant to be under Jesus's rule living as it was meant to be as God has created it to be this makes what we look at next all the more absurd to think that this is how it's going to play out here look at Revelation 20 verse 7 we read here now when the thousand years have expired Satan will be released from his prison and we all go, why? <laughs> no! And notice it says in verse 8, he's going to go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. 
The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. That's what we said earlier. The, the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet are the first inhabitants of hell or the lake of fire. And now the devil's gonna be placed in there and he's gonna be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell is not Satan's home. Hell is not where Satan loves to hang out. Hell is gonna be a place of torment for Satan. And his desire is to lead as many people away from the Lord and drag as many people down with him as possible. Now, why a final rebellion? Why would God ever, when he's got Satan trapped, he's in, he's in the bottomless pit, he's chained, he can do no harm, why would you ever let him go? Well, I believe it's for one reason, it's to reveal the condition of the human heart. Because a lot of people love to say, if I was just brought up in a better home, with a loving family, I, I wouldn't be as bad as I am. Or people say, I'm just a product of my environment. The world is messed up and so I'm just messed up myself. There's so much evil in the world and I'm just, you know, letting these things play out in my life because of what I see all around me. A lot of people love to blame their, their situation, their condition, their character perhaps, on what they've experienced in the world and yet, what we're going to see through the millennium is that the heart of the problem has always been the problem of the heart. The heart of the problem has always been the problem of the heart. You see, as much as people love today to blame other things on why they are the way they are, we're going to see that through the millennium, we're going to have a thousand years of perfection, peace, prosperity, and yet, not even that is going to help people. Not even a thousand years of bliss can clean your heart. Only one thing can clean your heart, and that's the blood of Jesus. And that's why Jesus came and died on a cross. He gave himself for us. His sacrifice is the only thing that could eradicate sin and make us new. But you see, he's not going to force himself upon anyone. He gives everyone the freedom to choose. And there must be a choice so that we can exercise our freedom to choose. And so that's why God's allowed Satan to be that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour today to come in this world to steal, kill, and destroy. Is it gives people a choice. God's not going to force himself upon anybody. And without choice, there cannot be a loving relationship. If all we've got is God or God is forcing us to follow him, then there's no love there. It's just obligation. Or it's a default. It's, there's no other option. And God wants a loving relationship with us. He wants us to follow him because we choose to follow him. And when we choose to follow him, then we discover the blessing and the joy of life in him as he makes us new, as he saves us, redeems us, and blesses us. And so in this final time now in this capstone of human history one last time God gives people a choice he releases Satan from the bottomless pit and Satan goes out to deceive the nations and as this population explosion has happened with the natural um, people in the millennium what do we see that he deceives many so that the army that came against God in rebellion was as great as the sand of the sea that's a large amount that shocks me but it reveals something the perfect environment doesn't change the heart. Only God can change the heart. And, and we must choose to turn to him and say, I, I want to live for you. I want you to make me new and to change my heart. And so this final rebellion comes. And it reveals the tragedy that people are lost without Jesus. Jesus. But Jesus is the answer. In the end, the Lord comes back and he brings an end to it with just the notice it says, just fire came down and devoured them. And then the devil was captured and placed in the lake of fire. We need Jesus, my friends. And we need to choose to follow him and serve him. And when we do, he gives us a new heart to serve and follow him. Have you chosen to let Jesus rule in your heart today? Is he the king of your heart today? 
We look forward to that day when he will physically be the king over this whole earth. But today, he wants to occupy the throne of your heart. And he wants to be your king. And when we allow him to rule in our lives, guess what? We begin to experience some of the blessing that is awaiting us in the millennium. We get to experience some of those things now. The peace, the assurance, the blessing of the Lord today. That's ours as we yield ourselves to him and we become children of God that follow him and serve him. Make that choice today. If you haven't determined that in your own life today, and maybe you thought I can get by by just cleaning myself up or being a good person, nothing we do in ourselves can help ourselves. We can never make ourselves good enough to meet God's standards of righteousness. We need him. Only he can do that. And you need to repent of your sin. You need to put your trust in Jesus. And that, put your trust in the fact that he's done the work completely for you by dying on a cross. So that you can be spared from death yourself. Turn to Jesus. Put your trust in him. And know the blessing that he brings your life as you walk now in that righteous reign and rule of Christ. And experience his peace. As you experience that new life in him. All right. Let's pray. Worship team, would you come up? Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this time to look at just such great scripture and truth here today. And uh, Lord, we pray that we would live completely for you in these days that we find ourselves in. Lord, we pray that you'd come soon. We look forward to your soon return. But Lord, in the meantime, I pray that we'd be active as believers, living loudly and largely for you, being a a light in our... um, in the world around us making much of you lord let that be our passion desire to see many more come be added to the family of god that they could be spared from some of the difficulties to come and just find hope in you lord so use us go with us strengthen us by your spirit now for those that have been on the fence lord whether to surrender their lives to you just stir their hearts right now may they make that decision to yield to surrender knowing that it's only in you that we find life. And we find life not only today, but the assurance of everlasting life. What a blessing. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing one song in closing here.